This is an audio sermon recorded at the Church of Christ at Johnson Mill in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 3801 Johnson Mill Boulevard. But let's read first in the front from Matthew chapter 12 there at the top, verse 31 and 32. Jesus said this, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now Mark's record of this in Mark 3, verse 28 to 30. Mark says this of Christ, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now notice verse 30, Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. And now Luke's record of this in Luke 12 and 10. Christ said this, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Some people call this the unpardonable sin. Ever heard it called that? The sin that God will not forgive, the unpardonable sin. And there is a sin, and we've read it here from three different accounts, there is a sin that God will not forgive. It's called the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> I don't know how many times I've been asked through the years what this sin is. And I suppose that a lot of the people have asked me that have wondered if they've ever committed the sin. And so certainly that would be something people are interested in. If, if they've committed that sin, they certainly want to know it, but they don't understand what it is. And so sometimes they'll ask, what is this sin? And other people have asked me simply, not so much afraid that they've committed this sin, but they just simply want to know what it is. And unfortunately, what it is is not always taught. The truth about the matter is not always faithfully taught among brethren even, and a lot of people do not understand. And, and so we're going to take time this morning to study this. Hopefully in studying that it will benefit us, but it will also enable us to benefit other people. And when they should come or uh, asking us what it is, or should we run into those that are confused about it, then we'll be able to give them an answer ourselves. And you'll understand this, I think, completely when we finish the study here this morning. You'll know what this sin is. It's not very difficult to understand. And I could simply cut to the chase this morning and tell you probably in five or ten minutes what it is. But let's, let's, let's take time and do some detailed study about it, and maybe that'll be more beneficial. The first mistake I think people make in, in trying to understand what the blasphemy of the Spirit is is they don't define the word blasphemy. Isn't that amazing? They start out trying to figure out what the sin is, but they don't define the term blasphemy. So I put some word definitions down for you. <coughs> Pardon me, please. Some, some word definitions of the word blaspheme and blasphemy. And let's look at these two definitions there on the left side. The word blaspheme first. The Greek word there is blasphemio. That's Strong's word number 987. If you have a Strong's concordance, that's his word 987. It's from a root word of 989 in Strong's, blasphemos. And Strong says this, that the word blaspheme means to vilify, specifically to speak impiously, to speak, blaspheme, defame, rail on, revile, speak evil, unquote. Now notice the speaking that's involved here in these definitions. He uses words like speak, defame, rail, revile, speak evil, see. Uh, Thayer's Lexicon, page uh, 102, gives this definition. To speak reproachfully, rail at, revile, calumniate. So this word blaspheme then is speech, isn't it? Look at the word blasphemy. <coughs> the word blasphemy. It's the Greek word blasphemia, Strong's number 988. It's also from that root word 989, blasphemos. Strong says that blasphemy means vilification, uh, especially against God, 
blasphemy, evil speaking, railing. And then Thayer gives this definition in his lexicon, page 102. Thayer says blasphemy is, quote, railing, reviling, A, it's used universally of slander, detraction, speech injurious to another's good name, B, specifically, he says, it means impious and reproachful speech injurious to the divine majesty, unquote. So this is speech uttered impiously or irreverently against the Holy Spirit. When you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you speak evil against the Holy Spirit. You, you revile Him. You speak injuriously. You speak impiously against Him. Now listen, that ought to tell you this is a sin committed with the tongue. Understand that. You cannot blaspheme without speaking. So whatever, whatever sin this is, it's going to involve speech. And that's the first thing we need to remember, speech. That's how you commit the sin. Irreverent, evil speaking against the Holy Spirit is what it is. And it's committed with the tongue. <coughs> I remember, <coughs> pardon me, I remember years ago when I first obeyed the gospel, when I first became a Christian, of course I had read these scriptures and I wondered what this sin was. And I used to go around asking different brethren, brethren that I respected, what this sin was. And most every, every time I was told, well, it means to reject the gospel. You see, the Holy Spirit gave the gospel. He revealed the gospel. And, and so this means to go through life and reject the gospel. And uh, so there for a while I thought that's what the sin might be. That is not what it is. But there were brethren that were confused and they didn't know how to answer the question and that was the answer I got. So I would tell you first of all, as we look at some things that this sin is not, it is not rejection of the gospel. Now rejection of the gospel is a sin, but it's not this sin because this is speech. Remember, this is committed by speaking, not by rejecting. You can reject the gospel without saying a word. This is speech. Understand that, see. Uh, why, would, why would they think that rejecting the gospel might be the blaspheme against the Spirit? Let's look at Ephesians 3 there on the back, verses 1 to 5. <coughs> you see, the Holy Spirit revealed the gospel. Paul is sitting in prison now, writing to the church at Ephesus. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not revealed unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The gospel was revealed to the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, since the, uh, since the gospel was revealed by the Spirit, when you reject the gospel, you sin against the Holy Spirit. That's true. To reject the gospel is to sin against the Spirit. He revealed the gospel, and what you're in effect telling the, the Holy Spirit is, I don't want your gospel. And that's a sin. All right, to reject the gospel is a sin. Make no mistake about it. But it's not the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And besides this, to, to reject the gospel is not only a sin against the Holy Spirit, it's a sin against Jesus. Look at Romans 1 and verse 16, because the gospel belongs to Christ, see. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel belongs to Christ. And when you reject the gospel, you sin against Christ. You not only sin against the Holy Spirit, you sin against Jesus, against Christ. But more than that, beloved, the gospel belongs to God the Father. It's God's gospel too. Look at Romans chapter 15 with me in verse 16. Paul said that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So he calls it here the gospel of God. He said, I'm the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. So when you reject the gospel, you also sin against God the Father. You see, 
You sin against the whole Godhead when you reject the gospel. You sin against the Holy Spirit, but you also sin against Christ, and you sin against God the Father. And yet Jesus, when He talked about this sin, He said, All manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven unto men. And Jesus said, Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man Himself, it will be forgiven. But unto him that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, it will not be forgiven, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So this is a sin specifically against the Holy Spirit. And when you reject the gospel, you sin, all right, but you're rejecting the gospel that belongs to the entire Godhead, and it's a sin against the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit altogether. Now, how many of you, how many of you obeyed the gospel and became a Christian the first time you heard it? <clears throat> the very first time you heard the gospel and you understood it, how many of you obeyed it right there and became a Christian? Could I see a show of hands? I don't see any hands. You don't see my hand up either, do you? I should have obeyed it the first time I understood it, but I didn't. I, re I waited. I regret that, but I did. Probably just like you regret it. But you see, if rejecting the gospel is the sin against the Holy Spirit, if it's the blaspheme against the Spirit, once you ever reject the gospel, you've already committed the sin. And therefore, you could never be forgiven of that. See the logic? Take the case of Felix in Acts 24. Look at verse 24 there with me. <coughs> Excuse me. Felix was governor. And uh, we read here in this record, after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener, and communed with him. But after two years Porcius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Now here's Paul, he's in captivity, he's been captured by the Jews, and he's brought before the governor Felix. And he reasoned to him, him and his wife, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, and Felix trembled. But he told Paul, You go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. There's the rejection of the gospel. Now, if that's the unpardonable sin, Felix committed it. But then what do we read later? That he sent for Paul the oftener. He hoped that Paul might pay bribery money so that he could be loosed. He sent for Paul the oftener and communed with him, see. And he did this for two years. Shouldn't Paul have told Felix after he rejected the gospel the first time, Felix, there's no need of me preaching to you again. You don't need to be sending for me because you've already committed the unpardonable sin and you can never be forgiven. You've rejected the gospel. See, Paul never told Felix that. He evidently preached to him over the course of two years. And Felix just kept on rejecting the gospel. That's not the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's a sin, but it's not the unpardonable sin. See. Same thing with King Agrippa. If you look at Acts 26, <coughs> verse 27 and 28, we read there of Felix, or excuse me, King Agrippa, when Paul preached to him, Paul told him, he said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But you see, Agrippa rejected the gospel. You reckon Paul would have preached to him again and again? Absolutely. Absolutely would. And here's the point I wanted to make to you. Rejecting the gospel is not the unpardonable sin. It's an unpardoned sin. It can be pardoned when we finally obey the gospel. But to reject the gospel is not the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It is not the unpardonable sin. And we're looking at some things that this, this sin is not. I've had other people tell me, well, it's the sin of murder. It's the mur sin of murder. When you, when you murder somebody, you can never be forgiven. I was living down in Beaumont, Texas many years ago, and 
I went over to Orange, Texas. It's about 25 miles to the east of Beaumont, and I was visiting in a rest home there, talking to people about Christ and trying to set up studies for Bible studies and things. And I'd been talking to an older gentleman, studying with him there in the rest home. And after I taught him about the, uh, the gospel and about Christ and all, I asked him, I said, uh, would you like to be baptized? Would you like to obey the gospel? And he looked at me and he said, Pat, it wouldn't do any good. I said, why not? He said, I can't be forgiven. I said, what have you done that you can't be forgiven of? He said, I killed a man. I killed a man one time. Well, you know what I did with that guy? I took him to Acts chapter 2, which is where I'll take you, and have you look at verse 36 to 38. <clears throat> this is about 50 days after Jesus' death, and Peter's preaching to the very ones that killed him. In verse 36, he says to the Jews, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now back in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified. They were murderers of Jesus. They crucified Him. That's what Peter told them. Now if you're going to murder somebody, I sure wouldn't want to murder the Son of God, would you? These are the very murderers of Jesus, some of them. And yet what did Peter tell these people when they asked, what shall we do? Did he tell them, there's nothing you can do, you've committed the unpardonable sin, you've committed murder, and that can't ever be forgiven? No. No, he told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He offered them forgiveness. Yeah, murder can be forgiven. Murder is a horrible thing. But murder can be forgiven. It certainly can. Well, what about other sins like homosexuality? How about adultery? How about fornication and things? Idolatry. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11. <coughs> Paul told the Corinthians, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Look at these sins that the Corinthians had committed here. I underlined them for you. He tells them the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom. In other words, these kind of people right here will not go to heaven. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. What does that mean? It means homosexuals. That's the word there for homosexuals. There's, there's two Greek words, uh, arsenikwitai, they're translated in places male bed, and it refers to homosexuality. Abusers of themselves with mankind. Thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. Look at that list. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, and extortioners. He said these kind won't enter the kingdom. But look at verse 11. He said, and such were some of you. Some of you Corinthians were guilty of these sins. But he said to them, You're washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Every one of these things can be forgiven. Adultery, fornication, idolatry, uh, homosexuality, covetousness, being a thief, drunkenness, all of those things, even murder. None of these things are the unpardonable sin. They may be horrible sins. But everything that we've read here can be forgiven. 
And the Corinthians were guilty of all these things, and they were forgiven. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a particular sin. It's in a class by itself, we might say. It's very unique. Paul was a blasphemer. The Apostle Paul was a blasphemer, but he didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Look at 1, 1 Timothy 1, verse 12 to 16. Let's read about Paul. <coughs> Paul said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul said, I'm the worst sinner there's ever been. I'm the chief of sinners. Now he said, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. But you see, when Paul blasphemed, he didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. He blasphemed Jesus. And the Lord said, All manner of sin will be forgiven unto men, but the blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven unto men. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, against himself, he said, That will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemes the Spirit, that will not be forgiven, neither in this world and neither in the world to come. So Paul blasphemed, but he blasphemed Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, let's look at uh, some of Paul's sins here. Acts 26, verse 9 to 11. What all did Paul do? <coughs> he said, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them off in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So look what Paul did. He murdered Christians. He compelled other Christians to blaspheme Jesus. He said he punished them off in every synagogue. He said, I even went to strange cities or foreign cities trying to, trying to persecute Christians. So he was a blasphemer, folks, but he blasphemed Jesus, and the, all the Lord did was forgive him and put him into the ministry. Look at 1 Timothy 1 and 12 again. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. See, the Lord took him and used him to be an apostle. When you read your New Testament, you're reading the writings of a man that blasphemed the name of Jesus and murdered Christians. I wonder if there's somebody you know today had done the things that Paul did if you would read their writings. We read Paul's writings all the time because God cleans up sinners and He uses them. So when you're reading Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, you're reading the words of a persecutor and a blasphemer of Jesus and a murderer of Christians because Paul was forgiven for everything that he did. See, those sins, bad enough, bad as they were, are not to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. This is a specific sin against the Spirit, and it's in a class by itself. So the question still remains, what is it? What is the sin? Well, in Matthew chapter 12, this was the opening scripture I had you read. And there on the back side you'll see the text of Matthew 12, verse 22 to 37. What I did... If you look over there toward the right side, you'll see the word wherefore in red, verse 31. <clears throat> and we started in at Matthew 12 and verse 31, and, and that passage said this, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. When you're studying your, your scriptures and when you come to a word like wherefore, or a word like therefore, these are transitional words. And what, what you run into when you find that word like wherefore is, 
what is about to be said or written is going to be said or written because of what already has been said or written, what already has taken place. That means you need to back up. Wherefore is a, is a transition from something that's already taken place and a point's about to be made. And so what we need to do is back up in the text. We read the word wherefore. Why, why is he using that? Why, is he, why does he bring up all of a sudden this blasphemy against the spirits? Well, let's go back before the word wherefore in verse 31. Let's go back to verse 22. And I want to do that with you. And let's read a little bit from Matthew 12. We'll read before verse 31 and we'll read after verse 31. <coughs> verse uh, 22. Matthew says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Now we've got a devil possessed man, and they bring him to Jesus, and this devil causes him not only to be blind, but to be dumb. And that word dumb doesn't mean he's a dummy, it means he can't speak. He cannot speak. He's blind and he can't speak. Why is he blind and why can't he speak? Because he's got a devil in him. He's possessed with the devil. And the devil won't let him see and speak. See, Verse 23. He, he had Jesus uh, healed the man, see, so that he could see and speak. And in verse 23, all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? What did they mean by the son of David? David's offspring, the Messiah. They saw the miracle and they said, This has got to be the Christ. See? Because now they see a man that can, can see and, and speak, whereas he could do neither. And they knew Jesus had cast this devil out of him. And they said, this has got to be the, the Messiah, the, the, the son of David. You see, the Lord did these miracles to establish that he was the Christ, the son of God, and it was working. They, the people were beginning to believe in Jesus because of the miracle. And his enemies didn't like this. Look at verse 24 now with it. <coughs> but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Uh, they couldn't deny the miracle. The Pharisees couldn't deny this miracle. So what they tried to do was discredit Jesus. They said, Yes, he, he, uh, he did the miracle okay, but he did it by the power of the devil. He did it by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Now right here is the sin, folks. See, they're saying that he did the miracle, but he did it by the power of the devil, by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And that's blasphemy. What they've done is called the Holy Spirit, who is the power by which Jesus did his miracles. They've called the Holy Spirit the devil. That's blasphemy, see. There it is right here. Jesus now will introduce a series of arguments to destroy their, their accusation. Look at verse 25. <clears throat> Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? You know, that's a pretty good argument. When you've got a house divided against itself, that house can't stand. When you've got a city divided against itself, the city won't stand. When there's a nation divided against itself, the nation will fall. And Jesus said if Satan is casting himself out, if he's divided against himself, then he'll destroy his own kingdom. He'll actually destroy that kingdom. If you'll think about different people here possessed with, with the devil, and if the devil came around and cast himself out of each one of these, then he's destroying his own kingdom. He rules these people. He possesses them. If he throws himself out, he's, he's losing his reign over them. He's destroying his own rule, his own kingdom. See, That's a pretty good point Jesus made. Why would the devil cast himself out? Why would Beelzebub cast out devils? See, It's his point. Good point, ain't it? But he goes on and makes some more arguments now. Verse 27, <clears throat> If I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? 
Therefore, they shall be your judges. You know, Jesus wasn't the only one that cast out devils. Others did. All the apostles did. If you'll read Matthew chapter 10, when He sent His twelve disciples out on the, what we call the limited commission, He gave them power against unclean, unclean spirits to cast them out. Do you remember the time that Jesus selected a 70, 70 men and sent them out two by two? He gave them power against unclean spirits. There were 70 men that cast them out. He chose another 70 after that. Now if He had a 70 and another 70, and then He had 12 apostles that cast them out, and then He Himself cast them out, that's at least 153 people on earth in the Lord's day that could cast out devils while He was still here on earth. And He said, if I'm casting out devils by the Spirit of God, by whom do your children cast them out? Some of these 70 or these others may likely have been descendants of these very Pharisees. So He said, if I'm doing this by the power of the devil, really what they were saying is, so are my, so are my children. Jesus is casting them out by Beelzebub, and so are my children. Because the same power by which these others were casting out devils, that's the power by which Jesus was casting out devils. See. And so what He's done, he's, he's, he's told them, if you're accusing me of this, you're in effect accusing your own children. That's pretty, pretty ridiculous, isn't it? He goes on with His arguments. <coughs> he said in verse 28, But if I cast out devils, by the Spirit of God, then the Kingdom of God has come unto you. Now look at that statement, that's important. What is the power by which Jesus cast out devils? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. What did they say the power was that He cast out spirits by? Beelzebub, the devil. Jesus said, I'm casting out devils by the Spirit of God. They said, you're casting out devils by the devil, by Beelzebub. In essence, they call the Holy Spirit Beelzebub. They call the Holy Spirit a devil. There's the sin right there. Isn't that speech against the Holy Spirit? You see, that's evil speech against the Holy Spirit. That's blasphemy against the Spirit. There's the sin right there. Look at verse 29. <coughs> he said, Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. How many of you would go into Mike Tyson's house and start stealing his things when Mike was there? If you would, God help you. You're not very smart. <laughs> I don't want to steal anything that Mike Tyson has, but I'm going to tell you something. I would not go in that house with Mike there if I were going to steal it. You don't go into a strong man's house and steal his goods except you bind the strong man. I think I'd be nervous even if Mike were bound. I'd feel like he's going to break away any time anyway and clean my clock, and I think he probably would. <coughs> Jesus is really telling him, I'm binding the strong man. I'm binding the devil, and I'm, I'm robbing his house. I'm casting, I'm casting him out, see. I've got the devil bound. I'm stronger than him, see. And so that's, that's proof enough. He's bound the devil. Look at verse 30. <clears throat> he said, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. There's no middle ground with Jesus. He that is not with me, he said, is against me. Maybe we need to look at that closely. He didn't say, He that's against me is against me. He said, He that is not with me is against me. You don't have to just outright oppose Jesus and fight against Him. If you're not with Him, you are against Him. I've had people say to me at times, well, Pat, I'm not doing, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to obey the gospel, but I'm not hurting anybody. You know, this is, this is just my, it's my life. But the point is, we are hurting somebody. We influence somebody. Every one of us has influence. And if we're not with Jesus, we're against Him. And He said, if you're not gathering with me, you are scattering abroad. I want you to think of that statement. He didn't say, he that scatters, you know, he that scatters is, is, is scattering abroad. He said, he that's not gathering with me is scattering abroad. 
Y'all understand what he's saying? If you and I are not gathering souls for Jesus, what are we doing? We're scattering souls. He that's not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. There is no middle ground with Christ, and that's what he wants them to know. Verse 31. <clears throat> Wherefore, now that's because of what he's already said and what's happened. Wherefore I say unto you, you Pharisees and all, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh a word against the, the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. There's the sin named right there. But watch verse 33. He goes on now. He said, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. What's he talking about here? Well, he pictures a couple of trees. Let's just draw a tree out here. When you've got a tree like this, and, and uh, let's say you've got a peach tree in your yard, and every year during the time of peaches, this tree produces just the best, ripest, juiciest peaches you've ever seen, and it's just full of fruit. And every bit of that fruit is good, and it's that way every year. What does that tell you about that tree? That's a good tree, isn't it? That's a good tree. What if you've got this uh, peach tree in your yard? Every year when it comes time for peaches, it has these little old bitty peaches on it, and they're hard as they can be, and they've got little old black specks all in them, and they're just hard. And all that fruit is bad. It's corrupt. What's that tell you about that tree? That's a bad tree. That's a bad tree. And here's the Lord's point. He said, either make the tree good and the fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. A good, a good tree, as he goes on to tell us here. Let's read on. A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, and neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. See? And, and, and what's, what's he mean by all this? Why, why is he using this, these words? Let's look at the miracle that he did. We've got a man here that is, uh, he's blind, and the man is uh, not able to speak. Not able to speak. Jesus cast the devil out of him, and now... The man can speak and he can see. Was that good? Was that good fruit? What did they say produced it? Beelzebub. What they're saying was there's good fruit here produced by a bad tree. He cast the devil out, that's good, but he did it by Beelzebub, prince of the devils. What they're saying is a bad tree just produced good fruit. Jesus said that's impossible. A good tree produces good fruit, fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. The tree is known by his fruit. Why would the devil cast himself out? He doesn't. The devil does nothing good. Jesus once said to the Jews about the devil, in John 8 and 44, he said, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil does nothing good. You've got to remember that. Nothing. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And the Lord said he was a murderer from the beginning. You and I are going to die one day. Who caused that? The devil. He's killed every one of us. When he got to Eve back in the garden, he killed every one of us. Because death came into the world and passed upon us. See? That's what kind of person the devil is. And the Lord's right. Let's go back and look at 33 again, now that we've seen that. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, 
How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now these words that, that we speak come out of where? They come forth from the heart. When you blaspheme, that comes out of the heart. An evil heart, see. And what he's really showing these Pharisees is, you see, even though you commit the sin of blasphemy by speaking, everything comes out of the heart, comes from within us. And what's that tell you about the heart of these men? It was evil. They had an evil heart. That was the problem. That was the sin here. I put a, a the miracles of Jesus are really what prove that He's the Christ, the Son of God. That's why Jesus did so many miracles. Uh, look at John 3 there on the back, verse 1 and 2, and let's look at Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now Nicodemus was a different kind of Pharisee. The Pharisees in Matthew 12 said, yes, he's doing these miracles, but he's doing it by Beelzebub. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, said no. No man can do the miracles you're doing unless God is with him, not Beelzebub. Nicodemus understood the power by which Jesus did his miracles had to come from God, see. And it's the miracles of Christ that, that cause us to believe he's the Son of God. Look at John 20, verse 30 and 31. John said many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. It is the miracles of Jesus that produce our faith in Him as the Christ. See? And uh, because no man could do those miracles unless God was with him, not Beelzebub, God. Have you ever noticed when you read the preaching of the gospel, when the gospel was preached the first time to the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Peter was the preacher. Have you ever looked at the first thing that he said in his sermon? When you preach the gospel, what's the first thing you preach? You preach the miracles of Jesus. That's what Peter did. Acts 2 and 22, read it there. Peter stood up to preach. He said, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he said, you've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Before he ever preached the Lord's crucifixion, he preached his miracles. He did the same thing in Acts 10 when the gospel was first preached to us Gentiles for the first time. Peter again was the preacher. And the first thing he said to his audience was, of Christ, he said, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The first thing he preached was the Lord's miracles. Because it, it is the miracles of Jesus that establish him to be the Messiah, the Christ. What does this have to do with what we're studying today? Well, Look at the diagram down here in the bottom right corner on your chart on the front. <clears throat> the miracles of Jesus prove He's the Christ, the Son of God, and the scribes and Pharisees sought to destroy the influence of Jesus. They did not want people believing in Him. And He had just done this great miracle of casting a devil out of a man, now Him being able to see and speak. And the Pharisees couldn't deny that miracle. They never tried to deny it. They never said, Jesus didn't do this miracle. It couldn't be denied. He did the miracle. He cast out the devil. What they wanted to do was discredit Jesus. 
so people wouldn't believe in Him. And in order to do that, they spoke against the Holy Spirit. Jesus cast that devil out by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's how He cast out devils. So in order to discredit Jesus, they said, yes, He did the miracle, but He did it by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Look at Mark 3, verse 22 down here in the bottom. The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. Matthew 12, 24, When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, prince of the devils. Mark 3 and 30, Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So rather than attribute the power that did this miracle to God, or to the Holy Spirit. They said that He did the miracle, but He did it by the devil. He did it by Beelzebub. And since the Lord did it by the Holy Spirit, you'll see the diagram there of Jesus. You'll see that, uh, that S there in the circle, standing for the Spirit. They called the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus Beelzebub. They called the Holy Spirit the devil. Is that blasphemy? Absolutely. That's blasphemy. And there's the sin right here. The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. They call the Holy Spirit Beelzebub, Prince of the Devils. That's blasphemy. It is not rejecting the Gospel. It is not murder. It is not uh, idolatry, adultery, fornication, homosexuality. It's not any sin like that. All of those sins are forgivable. This sin, Jesus said, will never be forgiven. Have you wondered why? Why will God not forgive this sin? I have a theory on that. I, I don't know that I can prove this, but I want to share it with you. This is just my view. Why can't the Lord forgive this sin? And my, my thinking is this, because whoever would commit this sin probably can't repent. You see, when you're evil enough that you hate Jesus Christ enough that you'll attribute His miracles to the devil in order to discredit Him and keep others from believing in Him. In other words, if you're so evil you're willing to call the Holy Spirit a devil, then you're probably not going to repent. And I doubt that this kind of heart, I think this heart is so evil, the person that would do something like this is so wicked that they cannot repent. They have no they have no godly sorrow that will allow them to work repentance. And when you and I can't repent, we can't be forgiven. Repentance is a requirement for forgiveness. And God likely would forgive this sin too, but I, I rather doubt this person is so wicked they're beyond forgiveness. That's just a theory. It doesn't matter because the Bible says this sin will not be forgiven in this world, nor in the world to come. Let me close by saying this. Disobeying the gospel, refusing to obey the gospel is not the unpardonable sin. But I would tell you this, we may as well blaspheme the Holy Ghost as go through our life rejecting the gospel. Because if we don't reject the gospel, we're going to be lost. We're going to go to hell. And that is in 2 Thessalonians 1 there at the bottom on the back, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 to 9. Paul said to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. What's going to happen to you if you don't ever obey the gospel? You're going to be punished with everlasting destruction. What would happen to you if you obeyed, or excuse me, if you blasphemed the Holy Spirit as these Pharisees did? You would be punished with everlasting destruction. See, We may as well blaspheme the Spirit as to reject the gospel and to continue to do that because the result is the same. See. Rejecting the gospel is not the unpardonable sin. It is an unpardoned sin. It can be forgiven. All you got to do is obey the gospel. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. To receive new sermons each week, subscribe on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and like us on Facebook. 
Thanks for listening, and God bless.